I will mask on occasion, and then the mask will be off on occasion, but I will always have to have my microphone on. Please remind me. Good folks, greetings in Christ. Blessed Sabbath to you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. Our call to worship comes from the 19th Psalm, the opening verses. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming God's handiwork. One day pours forth the news to the next, and one night informs another of what needs to be known. There's no speech, no words. Their voices can't be heard, but their sound extends throughout creation. Their words reach the ends of the earth. Let us worship our creator who has written love into the very fabric of the world. Please pray with me. Almighty God, as your spirit swept over the waters of creation, sweep over us now, creating something new. In this time of worship, but also each day, call us away from the distractions of the world to experience what you are doing now in us and through us, in and for the world. Well, God, open to us a new awakening, a new beginning, where we look through the lens of the goodness of your creation. In our worship today, turn us away from that which is not your will for us and lead us into the good light. We pray in the name of Jesus who leads us into life itself. Amen. I would call on our deacon who will lead our, before that, I would call on you to rise in body or spirit <laughs> and join us in our hymn, number hymn number 36 for the fruit of all creation. Let me say a word. The tune should be familiar, but there's some newer words to this. Let us sing God's praises. <laughs> Creation, thanks be to God.
morning. I'm Kimberly Grove, and I serve as a deacon here at First Presbyterian Church. When we gather in God's name, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside the sin that clings so closely. Brothers and sisters, let us rid ourselves of what we no longer need to carry, trust in God to forgive us and relieve us from the burdens of our shame and sin. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. God of Israel, God of the church, God of all creation, you gather your people in order to cultivate in us good fruit. Too often we neglect our relationships in the community so that it looks like tended vineyard. We neglect the pruning disciplines of self-examination through your word of judgment and us that we can and should manifest in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now for silent prayers of personal confession. Family of God, Scripture tells us that it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. And this is not our own doing. It is a gift from God. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. time in our worship, I would invite the young disciples to come down front for their time with Ms. Laura. Good morning. Y'all want to scoot around? ever seen a globe before? A globe? Let's look at this right here. What is this? What is this? It's the earth, isn't it? Does anyone know where we live? No? No? Let's see. All right. In America, yes. We live in the United States. The United States is right here. You see? We live in South Carolina and it is right there where my finger is. You see it? It's teeny tiny, right there where my finger is. You see it, okay, all right. So do you ever wonder how we got all this colored stuff as land and all the blue is water? Does anybody ever wonder how that came to be? No. <laughs> so the very first words in the Bible, they say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on to tell us all about God's creation. So I want to show you all something. We've got some, some tools here. We've got some wood. We've got a hammer. Some string. Some glue. Some tape. A screwdriver. Some nails and screws. And some scissors. We could make something pretty cool out of all this, couldn't we? Do you think that's what God used? I don't know. Let's find out. So God used tools to make all the beauty around us. But do you know what his tools were? His words. That's right. That's right. <laughs> In his hands. <laughs> the first thing that God created was light. He said, let there be light. And there it was. And then God said, now repeat after me, it was good. It was good. Okay. And then God said, there needs to be a space 
to separate the waters from the heavens and the heavens from the waters. So God created the sky. And God said, it was good. Y'all repeat that. It was good. Next, God brought all the waters and earth together to make the oceans and the seas and to create dry land between them. And then he covered the dry land with flowers and trees and grass. And God said, it was good. God paused and looked around at all the beautiful trees and he said, it was good. That's right. He created the moon and the sun and the stars, and they were beautiful. And and God looked at them in the space, and God looked at them, and again he said, it was good. Then God created the birds and the fish, and he blessed them and told them to multiply so that we would see an ocean filled with many fish in all shapes of sizes. And the air would be filled with all the birds that were so beautiful. And he looked at them and smiled and said what? It was good. Finally, God made the animals. Tall, skinny giraffes, furry little squirrels. He made cute little kittens and big, strong lions. Many different animals that were all unique. Then God made man and woman. And the Bible tells us that he made people to be like him. And then he put them in charge of everything that he created. The fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and every living creature. And God said, it was good. And when he finished, he looked around at everything that he created, and he said, that is very good. All right. So what do you guys think about that? What do you think about God's creation? It's a beautiful place that we live, isn't it? And we're all unique. Just like God created unique fish and birds and animals, he created unique boys and girls and mommies and daddies. And you, yep, boys and girls, that's right. Everyone is unique. All right, can we, can we make our praying hands? All right, let's pray with me, okay? God, we thank you that you alone are creator. You are powerful and so very creative. Thank you for making us in your image and making all things very good. Amen. Okay, all right. You guys, if you're ready to go to extended worship, then you can go with Miss Callie and Miss Nancy, okay? Thank you, Laura. As God's gathered people, we rejoice in the gift of prayer. Often at this time in worship, I will remind us, instruct us that prayer is a, is a duty, is a task, but it's also a great gift and a joy, knowing that God's heart is open to us to receive, but also it goes both ways, to flow into us. In this time of prayer today, I would particularly ask that we keep in mind a couple of families, folks in our church family. Mary Kathleen Duncan, Mary Kathleen Weeks Duncan, is a daughter of our church. She now serves as a Presbyterian pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Greenville, and she is undergoing treatment for cancer. She had surgery this week that went well, and she's recuperating, and um, we continue to pray with and for Mary Kathleen Duncan. We also want to pray with the family of Terry Wurschler and with Terry himself. Terry had Um, A pretty serious health episode. He's at the hospital now. I don't know a lot of details. I do know he's recovering, but had to have some surgery. If we could pray for Terry Wurstler. As always, dear friends, we have other situations, people, predicaments perhaps, but also joys and concerns. Thanksgiving, we live to God. In this day, particularly, we continue to be mindful and remember and to honor what has happened uh, 20 years ago on yesterday's date. But we remember also our calling to be a united people 
and to seek God's guidance and how to best respond to the evil that targets us. So I invite you to join me in a time of prayer today and certainly to remember the gift of prayer every day. Let us pray. Blessed, praised, honored, glorified is your name, our holy God. Words alone cannot adequately express our praise and thanksgiving, O Holy One. May the words we pray, may my words and our thoughts honestly reflect our desire, the devotion of our hearts. May our prayers guide us to a strong and right relationship with you. And so we ask in your mercy to hear our prayers. We pray for health and healing in the midst of our continuing crisis of disease. Strengthen medical professionals who have spent their reserves of endurance. Encourage them, encourage the caregiving families, encourage us all when death prevails despite heroic efforts. Grant us courage and confidence in the face of our trials. Show us all signs of your healing grace, but especially those who are ill and ailing now. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Father Almighty, as our nation marks 20 years since the attacks of September 11th, 2001, we pray for a collective moment of pause. Help us stop what we are doing, holy God. Help us set aside the stress and the strain of the everyday to honor lives that were lost, to care for families devastated, to honor the first responders who ran toward danger to help and save. May the memory of this terrible and tragic day make us ever more motivated to work for pre peace across our world and across our nation and in our hearts. Help us to build bridges and partnerships here in our community, in our nation. Help us to build cultural, global, and interfaith bridges and partnerships of mutual care and understanding. Help us to stand strong and not to give in to fear and hate. Merciful God, as we remember the pain of that tragic day, fill us with your peace that passes all understanding, but most of all, fill us with the hope that your kingdom will come and your will be done. Again, we ask that you bind up the wounds of the suffering among us, provide help and healing and hope, provide safety and security, provide liberation for those without the full measure of life and freedom, be with families facing eviction, be with those who are seeking sanctuary, be close to the grieving, those we know and those we don't know. Oh God, our God, we ask all these things we ask that you continue to help us carry our burdens, especially now when the road forward seems unclear at times. Turn our eyes to where your skies are full of promise. Tune our hearts to your brave love. Fill our souls with moral courage so we can find our purpose and our path in you. United as a family of faith and as the body of Jesus Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, O oh God. We ask finally that you hear the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. So we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This Sunday, we begin our walk in reading God's scripture, in preaching and teaching. We begin our walk in worship through the story of the Bible. We're following the narrative of God with God's people, and we're going to start today at the start. We're going to begin with the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. I want to invite you to turn in your Bible or pew Bible to the first words of the Bible, of God's Word for us. We'll continue from this beginning to the covenant with Israel, the chosen people, to the prophets who come to a sinful Israel, to their prophecy of a Messiah, a Savior for the whole world. We'll celebrate that birth of this Messiah in Advent and Christmas, 
And then in January, we continue this Bible story, this narrative, as we take up in the gospel according to John. But let's start with the beginning, shall we? Reading from Genesis chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant-yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, 
everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good, and God rested. Please pray with me. Morning has broken. Like the first morning, the birds have spoken like the first birds. We praise you, O God, for the singing. We praise you for this morning. We praise you for all creation springing fresh from the word. Amen. So, a new school year has begun. We're just a few weeks into the new school year, and I make it a habit to check on our students and our teachers. Or maybe, let's reverse, I check on our teachers and our students, but both. And I'll ask them the question, I say, how's the school year going so far? And I hear, oh, we're off to a good start. I've heard that more than once this morning. But on occasion when I ask, how's the beginning of the school year? I hear, we're off to a rocky start. We had to quarantine the first week and a half of school, and that meant we were off to a slow start. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in life's soundtrack, the opening notes of a new movement, a new period or piece in our lives, the opening notes, the beginning can set a tone, pun intended, and it can be good or discordant. It's good to have a good start. So let me ask you to think with me, for a moment, how is this season, how is this day in your life beginning? Have you ever heard the saying that a good start is half done? A good start is half done. Well, as God's people, we confess there is work that remains to be done. I don't know if it's half or more than half, but there's work to be done. In our lives, in the world, there's work to be done for all of God's creatures and for all God's family. But there's good news in what to many of us seems like troubled times. There's good news for these times. God who speaks us into being, who says, let there be, gives all of creation and gives all of us creatures created in God's image good beginnings. And sometimes, in fact, every day, the day arrives anew, a new beginning. And sometimes when we've hit the place where there's only bad, there's the opportunity and gift of a good start, a restart, if you will. Scripture opens, God's Word opens, not with a theological essay, not with a scientific textbook, but it opens with worship in a faith testimony. Here's how it started. It's almost like you got a preacher up there starting the Bible. Here's how it started. It's testimony to the one who makes us. Genesis, the beginning of God's story, opens with a litany of creation. First day, second day, third day. And then that refrain, it was good. It was good. God calls everything into being, and creation, Genesis tells us, it jumps, creation jumps out of the starting blocks. It's ready to go. It's raring to go. And so it's a good start to this existence, this universe, and this life that God gives. Everything God says in this faith testimony of Scripture, everything is, in a word, tov. It's a Hebrew word, the original language of Genesis, tov, three little letters, T-O-V in English, but it's a powerful word. It means good. 
as God works in creation, God steps back and goes, Tov. Or in our thinking, that's good. I like that. God's creation is majestic and it is awesome. It is intricate and it is beautiful. When God steps back and surveys everything, everything, God says, not tov, but tov tov, which means very good. This is really good, God says. <laughs> And that's what God says. With a divine thought and a word, three words in our biblical testimony, let there be. God calls into being a vast and varied creation, cosmos and life, life that erupts unexpectedly. And this happens out of, our testimony is this, God can make this happen out of chaos and nothingness and darkness, and the abyss. Where there's nothing but chaos, God brings this beautiful, rich, abundant, teeming with life, teeming with hope, exuberant creation. Always from the beginning, God, and always from the beginning, good. Divine order out of chaos. That is our faith testimony. If we Read Genesis and hold fast to it. This is our faith statement. God can take chaos and make something beautiful and rich and varied. And yet, as God's people, and as we look at our lives, and as we look at the world today, even as we're called good, we also sometimes fall out of the good. It happens. We have fallen into being less than good. Sometimes creation is despoiled and mistreated. Sometimes people are not treated as if they are created in the image of God, but as something less. One writer talks about this, going a little further into Genesis and talking about those first people, those two people who represent us, Adam and Eve, male and female created in God's image, and yet that moment when they begin to live by different values and understandings. The writer says, they give in to temptation. And Adam and Eve, when they do this, are essentially claiming that God is not good. They're giving in to the deception that good is possible apart from God, the source of all good. The scriptures call this being separated from the life of God. And when these first people eat that forbidden fruit in the story, it isn't about the fruit. It's about their dissatisfaction with the world that God has placed them in. In other words, creation is not good enough for them. That which God gives to us, entrusts to us, and says, this is really good. This is my best work. Here you go. We say in, over and over again, it's not enough. It's not good enough. Creation and we creatures always will find our way back, however, in the creator. Creation finds its way, its, its bearings, by looking to the Creator. People find their bearings when we look to the one who made us, who creates us and calls us and claims us. It is so tempting at times when we look at the world around us and the chaos in the world, the chaos in our minds and hearts. And I pray with you if that's happening for you right now. It happens to everybody sometimes. But we see this chaos and this darkness and we see that abyss of hopelessness and despair and we think, the good is gone. One of our youth, wisely, in our discussion of this passage this morning, one of these said, you know, I think one of our problems is we spend too much time looking at the bad and we just don't even take time to look at the good. The good is gone, we're tempted to say. And yet from its beginning... Creation is really good. So in our congregation, we have a couple of families who are lavender farmers. Did you know that? There are two families that grow lavender here in the area, and um, they're doing quite well. And lavender, I've learned a little bit about it. 
My wife has purchased lavender and my house smells like lavender, which I'm told is a good thing. I'm told it is. It is. It's good. It's supposed to be very restful and calming and so forth and so on, and it's beautiful. But also, did you know, we've learned this, there is culinary lavender. You can cook with lavender. And so one of our, one of our good folks in our church family baked lavender cookies and brought them to us. And I, as far as I knew, I'd never had lavender cookies. And they said, you need to try this. And I'm thinking, do I really want to have a cookie that tastes like lavender? But I didn't say that because that would have been ungracious. So I said, I'll take a bite. And I took a bite, and it, tasted, it was a really good cookie, but I really couldn't taste lavender. And they said, well, take another bite. And so I, I finished the cookie. And, and you know what? I could taste a hint. I began to taste the lavender, and it was good. And then later, when I ate another cookie, not much later, <laughs> I knew with every bite, I knew what to, I was tasting and looking for. I, I sensed a little lavender with every bite. And so it is with creation in our lives. There is... God is calling. <laughs> there is in creation a light. Hey, let me ask you, would you turn your phone off? <laughs> let me do mine. It's off. Okay, just like with the lavender cookies, in creation there's always, good, there's always goodness there. It's always there. It's, it's, it's embedded in the heart of everything and in our lives. It's just sometimes it feels buried or hidden or it's covered up by all this other stuff when it's always there. The goodness is always there. It was planted there. It was baked into creation by God from the very beginning. Goodness. We cannot take that away. We can cover it up. We can... We can try to cover it up with other things, but that goodness is there. One friend sums it up this way. Life is messy, but marvelous. I love that. One writer puts it this way. He, he reminds us. He says, it's not a matter of we're waiting for heaven, and heaven is this perfect world to which we perhaps someday shall go, and earth is, is this shabby, second-rate, temporary dwelling, and we're waiting just to be ready to depart from earth for something good. There's good here. From the beginning of God's Word, we see that the earth is a glorious part, a good part of God's creation. And it's entrusted to us to be part of making things Good. If you like the sound of the Hebrew, to make things tov. Let there be, God says, goodness. Let there be goodness. Let there be light. And let there be life. And let there be goodness. So how do we answer the call? How do we answer that call to be part of making things good because sometimes we are battered by sin, we are threatened by evil. We've seen what ha we remembered yesterday, what evil can do. We're tempted to despoil the gifts of the earth for our own gain. How can our being called into existence, how can our being be about God's work of creating and recreating and reclaiming? How do we get there? Well, good news. God is all about new beginnings. And when we entrust our lives to God, we can get a good start or restart. We can get a good beginning. And we have this new day. All of us here, I believe, have our next breath. Let's start there. Let's start there. Where... Where is there creative beginning needed in your life? Where is there chaos or darkness or a feeling of meaninglessness? And you need a new beginning. You need a good start. We are the people of God who are in covenant with God through Jesus Christ. 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, shows us God's will at work to call a new creation into being. That's what we believe. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is to call into being a new creation in you and all around you. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, when we remember this, who created us and to whom we are accountable as stewards of creation. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. For us there is one God, the Father, from whom comes all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things are made and through whom we exist. <laughs> That's where we find our purpose and our meaning. Jesus Christ is our vision of goodness. God says, let there be a people who follow Jesus and live into the image of God, the image in which I created them. Let them follow Jesus, be his people. And through him, bring out all the goodness within them, however deeply we may have tried to suppress or hide it. In Jesus Christ, that goodness awakens, baked into all creation, into every moment. And then let's get to work. Let's make the world good. There's a novel by Joyce Carey, and there's a scene in the novel, it's a, really, it's a strange person, a strange character. He's a half-mad artist. He's a painter, and he's painting a mural on the side of a condemned building. It's about to fall down. And to get up where he can paint this mural, he's on this kind of swinging scaffold. So here's this kind of half-crazed artist, and he's moving along trying to paint this mural as he does. And he's painting on the side of this old, dilapidated building. And what is he painting on the side of the building? He's painting his vision of the new Jerusalem, which is scripture talk for the new creation the new holy city and place of God. And so here he is, swinging along, just haphazardly trying to paint God's new creation on this broken down old building. And I share that with you because that's a great image for our job. Created in God's image, that's our mission, to paint the new creation on a condemned world, knowing that though the world may pass away, the picture will come true, despite all our wavering and waving, because of the goodness and grace of God. God can take what we do and make that picture come to life. And we see it. The blessing box over here. It's just a little box and people put crackers and canned goods and water in it. And they do that for hurting bypassers. People come by and probably are pretty down on their luck if they reach into a blessing box, but they do. And we pray they're blessed. Maybe they have their days got a little more good in it. Recently, the session debated for a while on something. We had a meeting this month, and we debated. We discussed. And you know, right now, because of COVID and other things, the economy being uncertain, our church finances are feeling the pinch a bit. A bit, not bad. You all have been gracious, and God has been gracious and generous. But we decided to take $116,000 which was basically our surplus from last year when we had PPP loan money and we had less expense. And we're giving that to the capital campaign solely for community and global mission. And we debated, because we could use that money elsewhere, $116,000. And you may have a thought on that, but our decision was, our prayerful decision was, we can do more good with that out in the world than paying our bills. Where's the good? Well, Jesus talks about a good Samaritan. Remember that story? A Samaritan. The enemies of the people, the rejected people, and says the hero of the story, the good one, is that Samaritan. So how are we going to be? He's the good neighbor in that story. How are we going to be good neighbors? Because we can be. We can be people of good news and loving community, even when we are threatened by disease or divided by toxic powers or we're tempted to serve ourselves and neglect others, it, we can, there is good in us. And there is good in them, whoever them is. The hope 
we have is that God will eventually do for the whole creation what God did for Jesus Christ. God is at work in the present, we believe, by the Spirit of Jesus to prepare for the world for a great remaking. In the words of N.T. Wright, listen, I'll close with this. This future, when it arrives, will not mean the abandonment of this present world, but rather its fulfillment. The whole creation, Scripture tells us, will be liberated from its present enslavement to the forces of decay and death. And you don't deliberate something, deliberate something by destroying it. All the beauty, all the goodness, all the pulsating life of the present creation is to be enhanced and lifted to a new level to the world that is to be. And there is strong incentive for us to work in the present to anticipate this new good creation in every way possible. That's the charge. I know we have a charge in benediction later, but that's your charge. So if you get it, go ahead and leave. That's fine. Nobody's leaving. For there is one God, the Father, from whom all things are made and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things are made and through whom we exist. Living for and giving ourselves to the way of Jesus, I promise you and I preach to you and proclaim to you that is a good start to your day. And it is a good start to whatever season of life you're in. And it is a good start for the entirety of our lives. That is our testimony. Let there be a people after my own heart following the way of Jesus Christ. Now I'm into that. I invite you to stand in body or spirit to affirm our faith. You have a portion of the brief statement of faith for the Presbyterian Church printed in your bulletin. And I invite you to join me in affirming these words and attending to them as we read them together. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. Ignoring God's command. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lives as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the path entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the sons of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a father who runs to like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. In response to God who gives us this good creation, we invite you to be part of the work of God through our congregation, through the church in this place, with your offerings, your tithes. We're not passing the plate at this time. We have an offering plate on the communion table. We have great baskets as you enter and leave. And also you can give online or by mail, but the point is, however you give and what you give, where you give, here or anywhere, may you do so knowing that God has called you to be part of God's work of making the world good. And so I invite you to meditate upon that as we are led in our offertory by our choir. Please note that we'll join in singing verse 5, which is on your yellow insert. So we're going to be singing along with them on the offertory at one point. Please be seated. It's not a mistake that the doxology was left out because the words of the verse 5 are the doxology just with the other tune. And so when it's getting time for you to join us, I'll turn around and I'll do this and stand together and we'll sing the words of the doxology with the wrong music.
Good morning. You may be seated. My name is Amelia White, and I will be leading us in our prayer of dedication this morning. Please pray with me. Loving God, bless the gifts we offer to you today. Multiply them like the grass of the earth and the flowers of the field. As a church, we promise to use these gifts for good. We promise to use them faithfully in love and mercy for others. Amen. I invite you to rise and body your spirit to sing our sending hymn number 24. We'll sing the first and last verses of God who stretched the spangled heavens. Perhaps new words to you, but I hope a familiar hymn. Tune. Our creator whose spirit brooded over the waters, over that chaos and darkness, continues to create as we've sung, giving us a new beginning most when we need it. So our charge today is to pray about the chaos, places and moments in our lives and in the world, and to recognize that God calls us to be part of the answer and response to that chaos with faith and hope and love and working for the good. Hear this word from the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected, provided it is received with thanksgiving. For everything is sanctified by God's word and by prayer. May we give thanks and go forth in the goodness that God bakes into creation and into our lives. Amen. <laughs> 